Feats are one of the best ways to add a ton of power to your character, whether it's improving an ability score, making them better at dual wielding, or simply making their spells more destructive. But this can be an overly indecisive time, so I'm here to help you by breaking it down into general, melee, ranged, and spellcasting related feats. Breaking it down by each class would cause some redundancy, so you should just jump to each section that fits your class. For example, Paladin would probably look at both melee and spell casting. There will always be feats that are situational for specific use cases that maybe benefit the role play you've created for your character. So please always err on the side of role play over min max as you'll just have far more fun with your gameplay. Also, I want to state that this video's design isn't to outright say that you must take these feats, but rather help you or help at least give you direction in deciding which ones will actually help you for the roles you've designed for your character. Keep in mind, you'll have three feats in Baldur's Gate 3 at levels 4, 8, and 12. If you're a fighter, you'll get a bonus one at level 6, and rogues get a bonus at level 10, giving those two classes four total feats. In my typical fashion of upfronting the knowledge of my videos, if you're really hard-pressed on deciding what to choose, you really just can't go wrong with feats like Lucky, which will give you three reroll dice, durable for full hit point heals on short rest, mobile for not provoking opportunity attacks, and of course, ability improvement, which gives you two juicy ability points on either one ability score or spread across two ability scores. You can't go wrong with any of those, but the rest are going to be dependent on whether you're doing melee, range, spellcasting, or a combination thus of. But that's really it. That's the TLDR of this video. If that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to enjoying your time in Baldur's Gate 3. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a very huge way, and I would greatly appreciate it. You can quickly navigate to any part of this video that interests you the most using the chapters about the timeline of the description. And if you need any help with any of the D&D &D terms that are brought up in this video, I have a full breakdown of those terms in the upper right-hand corner. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitch, where I will be streaming Baldur's Gate 3 with my solo and co-op playthroughs. Let's get started here on the best feats you should choose in Baldur's Gate 3. Let's get us kicked off with the general ability feats, meaning that they really apply to pretty much all classes, regardless of what your role is, melee, ranged, or spellcasting. And keep in mind, any feat that I don't talk about in this video, um, it's not because I'm opening up an OnlyFans, it's because it's just these are the ones that I want to focus on the most because they are maybe particularly good. But if you want to do something like, I don't know, Mage Slayer, I don't talk about it at all in this video. Go ahead and do it. You're not going to break the character. Your character's not going to become useless or anything like that. These are just the ones that really stand out as being particularly good as I go through this entire video. Again, just play the way you want. You spent your money. Do what you want with your escapism. So, when it comes to our feats, the very first one we're going to talk about is ability improvement. It's a very, very, very good one. You increase one ability by two or two abilities by one to a max of 20. Um, take for my bard, for example, he has 17 charisma. So this puts him up to, well, 20, or 19 if I want, almost a 20. Um, it's a really, really strong ability um, because you really want to get your ability score as high as possible for whatever character you're playing. Are you playing a sorcerer or a warlock or a bard? Get your charisma up. Maybe you're playing a strength-oriented um, fighter or well, barbarian. Then get your strength up. Maybe you're playing a dexterity-focused ranger, fighter, or well, rogue. Well, then definitely want to get your dexterity up. You get that up as fast as you can because it's going to give you more damage, make your spells better, whatever it is that you're keying off of with your ability score, you want to max that out pretty quickly. That is a very good first one. Another really good one to get is actor, especially if you are playing a row or i'm sorry a bard here this is going to increase your charisma by one but also you get a proficiency bonus is also doubled for deception and performance checks now when you start the game your proficiency bonus is only two right but that scales up to three and then eventually four so if i have a proficiency in perform or in deception that goes from two to four or three to six or four to eight whatever it is in the situation and i find that this is really good if you're the player character, if you're the PC. If you're not the player character, it's not terrible, but I'm probably gonna be stumbling into conversations with my player character more than my other characters, and this way I can take advantage of it a lot more, especially if I'm again playing a bard, which would use my performance role uh, because I probably have a proficiency in it. Everyone can, of course, have proficiency in performance if you wish, but roleplay-wise, I did it on my bard because I'm a bard. Another really good one is Lucky. 
Uh, not to, not talking about the hit Britney Spears song. So you gain three luck points, which you can use to gain advantage on attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws, or to make an enemy re-roll their attack rolls. This is different than the halfling's lucky roll. So luck points. These are basically, it's just saying these are your dice that you have. You've got three of these that you can use. So you use a luck point to gain advantage on your next ability check. Um, you can use a luck point to gain advantage on your next attack roll or saving throw or to make an enemy re-roll their attack roll. And you'll get this as a kind of like a reaction, more or less. Um, and it, But it won't cost you a reaction. That's an important distinction. A reaction, as it is stated as an actual reaction, you only are allowed once per turn. Lucky is outside of that. It is not considered an actual reaction. But it'll queue up in the same way. You're, oh, you made an attack roll. Well, hey, do you actually want to throw your lucky roll in here? Or you know what? You're doing an ability check. Uh, you want to throw your lucky roll in here? Or hey, you know what? Someone just hit a big hit on you. Did you want to throw your lucky roll in? It's a really, really, really good ability. And everyone can take advantage of it in a lot of big ways. Mobile is another good one. So your movement speed increases and difficult terrain doesn't slow you down when you dash. If you are, If you move after making a melee attack, you don't provoke opportunity attacks from your target and that's the really the reason i like mobile the most is that it allows me to get out of a tight situation without being able to trigger an opportunity attack so maybe i'm playing as my rogue and i want to go ahead and attack with my primary action then run away then I don't trigger that opportunity attack and then use my bonus action to go into stealth or whatever it is. There's a lot of really cool ways you can use mobile for not just simply um, being defensive, you can use it offensively. Hey, I attack and I'm gonna move somewhere else to put it so that I threaten multiple targets or whatever it is to put me into opportunity attack range. A lot of really great things come with mobile. The last one I wanna talk about in this section is durable. So your constitution is increased by one to a max of 20 and you regain full hit points each time you take a short rest. It's worth noting that almost every single D&D 5th edition uh, feat that was previously god-awful is now at least passable because they almost always now present you with an ability score increase. Uh, but durable is great here because you're now getting full hit points whenever you short rest. You get two short rests that you can use um, on a whim, so it's a really nice way to just kind of get healed up to full. Um, but this concludes our general feat section. Uh, just real quick before we exit this, uh, an example here would be Tavern Brawler. This was typically not good in 5th edition, but now I get an ability score from it, so it actually has some better use cases here. Or if I'm using unarmed attacks, it's quite nice. But uh, let's jump over now into our melee feats. So for melee, I want to start with a combo. And some feats work very well in conjunction when taken at certain points and at certain time. So I said you get a feat at 4, 8, and 12, right, respectively? Well, if you're maybe a melee-oriented class, getting Sentinel is a really good feat. So let's read this out. When an enemy within melee range attacks an ally, you can use a reaction, remember, you are allowed once per turn, to make a weapon attack against that enemy. The target ally must not have the sentinel feet. So just assume that they don't. Maybe it's a cleric, maybe it's your uh, wizard, whatever it is. So if they get attacked, you get to immediately attack that person. Then you gain an advantage on opportunity attacks. And when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, it can no longer move for the rest of this turn. So Sentinel gives you a lot of utility right out the gate. You get the ability to truly be a Sentinel, like a, a defensive kind of tankier um, paladin or fighter if you want to take that role. Or even if you just want to use this offensively, you definitely can because we're going to key this off of Polearm Master. And those who have played 5th edition, this is like a tried and true, really strong combination here. So Polearm Master. When attacking with a glaive, halberd, quarterstaff, or spear, you can use a bonus action to attack with the butt of your weapon. That's really nice. It shows you right here. Um, just one to four bonus damage or a bludgeoning damage. But you, this is the one. This is what makes it good. You can also make an opportunity attack when a target comes within range. Let's jump back to Sentinel. You gain advantage on opportunity attacks when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack. It can no longer move for the rest of the turn. So why Polar Master is particularly good is that you're getting that advantage on your opportunity attack. You're locking them down so they can't move anymore. So if they're trying to close distance to a friend, well, you just locked them down because the advantage you had on your opportunity attack because they came into range. Remember, opportunity attack works when someone leaves your uh, threat range. 
With Polearm Master, though, the important thing is Glaive and Halberd both have reach, meaning you can actually hit them at a further range than you would normally. Quarterstaff and Spear do not have reach. At least, I don't remember Quarterstaff happening. I know Spear doesn't. But Glaive and Halberd will allow you to hit them at a much further range. So, you put these two together, and you're actually able to have a lot of zone control around your party, around yourself, to lock things down and prevent them from moving around as, as freely. So, it's a very good combination. You'd use those two together. Now, another, and you would, you would do Sentinel first, followed by Polar Master. So, four, then level eight, respectively. Another really good separate than those two, and just going back to normal feats now, is Savage Attacker. When making weapon attacks, you roll your damage dice twice and use the highest result. So it's basically like advantage on your damage dice, right? This is really good if you're playing a Barbarian, especially a Half-Orc, which is going to take advantage of those critical hits, and more on that in a little bit. But a lot of ways to just kind of really make sure you maximize your damage or try to maximize your damage as much as possible when you are using um, weapon attacks. Now this says... When making weapon attacks, you roll your your damage dice twice, blah, 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 blah. Weapon attacks. So even though I've put this in the melee section, it does say weapon, so that does include ranged. And I'm not sure if that verbiage has changed from 5th edition, but it's nice to know that you can actually use this in the range section since range has so few actual applicable feats in Baldur's Gate 3 compared to 5th edition. Now, outside of this, we also have Great Weapon Master. By and large, I actually don't like the martial, quote-unquote, uh, uh, master traits. Heavy Armor Master, Light Armor Master, Medium Armor Master. They're not terrible, but I just don't like them as much as, say, Great Weapon Master, which is particularly good. And there's, the Shield Master is really good until the end of this section. But Great Weapon Master here, when you land a critical hit or kill a target with a melee weapon... You, make a, you can make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. So you can really do this to fine-tune on someone. Hey, you know, they only got two hit points left. Let me see if I can get a crit on them or kill them. If I kill them, boom, I get a bonus action to do another melee attack. Just try and bunch things up together and go to town. Or if you just land a crit hit, you're playing as a champion fighter that has... Um, not super set it that <laughs> got too much of a gym bro that has multi-classed into fight or uh, barbarian well i'm really going to take advantage of all these crits i can do and maybe also i'm a half orc so i'm just critting out the ass over here and this is going to allow me to just use a whole other weapon attack as a bonus action and then attacks with heavy melee weapons are prof that you're proficient with can deal an additional 10 damage at the cost of minus five to the attack roll but you can toggle this, so that's really good here, right? So you can just simply toggle that on and off. You you get all of the the benefits of this kind of passive feature without having to deal with whether or not you want to deal with that attack roll penalty for the for the massive damage bonus. It's entirely up to you, which I really really like about this one. Another one I'm going to talk about that is not amazing. Uh, dual wielding has always been a kind of a funky spot in Dungeons and Dragons, um, but. Dual wielder, you can use two weapon fighting, even if your weapons aren't light. So previously this meant that, you know, you had to use short swords, uh, falchions, or uh, like daggers, anything that says light in its description. And you gain plus one bonus to armor class while wielding a melee weapon in each hand. You cannot dual wield heavy weapons. So this allows you to dual wield long swords, different axes, whatever it is, that are not two-handed heavy weapons. So you can use this to your best advantage if you really want to drill down into pulling more weapons into your repertoire you can because this also gives you plus one AC as well. It's not an amazing feat, but I dual wield on this character. I dual wield on all my characters. I will probably take this knowing it's not a great feat, but because I want to take advantage of it. So this is an example of, hey, this is not a min-max option, but screw it. I'm going to take it because it's fun and it fits the way I want to play. Defensive Duelist, though, is a pretty good one. <laughs> when attacked while wielding a finesse weapon you're proficient with, you can use a reaction to add your proficiency bonus to your armor class, possibly causing the attack to miss. So if you're maybe playing a rogue or you're playing a dex-based character that's using finesse weapons, because remember, finesse weapons will scale with your dexterity instead of your strength if your dex is higher. Uh, my ranger and bard are both dex-based fighters that use finesse weapons. So defensive duelist here is going to allow me to use my proficiency bonus remember we talked about this earlier that's either two three or four depending on your level and just add it to my ac so if my ac is like 
15 because I'm using medium armor and my just stacked up uh, or medium armor. So that's plus two decks on top of it. Or I'm sorry, plus two armor class on top of it. Then my proficiency bonus is just two, three or four more on top of it. It really gives you a lot more durability and you get to use it on demand as far as when you want because it's a reaction. You only allowed one reaction per turn. Just remember that. So, hey, you know what? That's a pretty that's a pretty heavy hit coming my way. I'm going to pop on defensive duelist. Um, we also get charger, which is a very fun one from a thematic standpoint being able to just completely knock someone off of the ledge or whatever it is because you have a weapon attack or shove and the shove one's really nice because you can just push someone into a precipice maybe you're dealing with a goblin camp and you have people up on this bridge and you can just knock them off into the precipice and they're just dead they're out of the fight entirely so this is a really nice one especially if you're playing a barbarian that's not using a weapon that has a charge attached to it Last one in this section I want to talk about is Shield Master, which basically gives you the rogue monk evasion capability, but as a non-monk or rogue and just someone using a shield. So you gain plus two to bonus dexterity saving throws while wielding a shield. If a spell forces you to make a dex saving throw, you can use a reaction to shield yourself and diminish the effect's damage. On a failed saving throw, you only take half. On a successful, you don't take any. So this is just a really awesome way to be a tried and true sword and board defender of the righteous. You know, whatever you want to be when it comes to using a shield, this gives you a lot of defensive utility that you can really pull from. For our ranged feats, we really only have two. Um, anything that doesn't specifically say melee weapon or ranged weapon, savage attacker being an example, is something that would apply to both melee and ranged. But sharpshooter here is a very good one that goes in conjunction with crossbow expert. Crossbow expert has changed in this game compared to 5th edition, worth noting. Your ranged weapons do not receive penalties from high ground rules, meaning if you're shooting up, then you don't have to deal with the penalty here. When you attack from below, you have a minus two penalty. You don't deal with that anymore. And now, range weapons attack with we uh, I'm sorry, range weapon attacks with weapons you are proficient with have a minus five penalty to their attack roll, but deal an additional ten damage. I don't like that. That's toggleable, like like it was for um, the great weapon master, right? This is a toggleable. You can toggle this on and off. Sharpshooter, you cannot. So. Sharpshooter is something you should take later because it's something that's very punishing in the beginning of the game because maybe you don't have as high dexterity, whatever it is that's going to add to your attack roll. So I'd recommend you take this later compared to Crossbow Expert. And you would take these two in conjunction if you are dual wielding hand crossbows, which my bard isn't specific. But this is the only other real ranged feat because we don't have elven accuracy or whatever it's called um, added into the game yet or right now in its current iteration. So when you make crossbow attacks within melee range, the attack rolls do not have disadvantage. It used to be something related to bonus action. Um, so that's no longer in the game. You just simply, they do not get disadvantage. And your piercing shot also inflicts gaping wounds for twice as long. So that's very nice here. You get it a little bit longer in your gaping wounds, which has a little bit more damage. But those are your really your only two range feats. And if I were to use dual wielding hand crossbows, I would do crossbow expert and then sharpshooter. Moving into our spell casting feats, remember this isn't just because you are a spell caster like a sorcerer or a wizard, but these apply to whenever you are someone like a paladin or a ranger or a warlock or a cleric or anyone who casts spells in general. So spell sniper is quite good because first you get a cantrip and the number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by one. This is just like you get for uh, the champion of the barbarian, you know how you can reduce the crit by one, whatever it is, so that you actually crit on a 19 instead of a 20. So Having that is very, very nice because this effect can also stack. Shows you right there. And then you would just simply choose another cantrip. Remember, cantrips are a level zero spell. You can cast them every turn if you want. They don't use a spell slot. So it's just a nice way to get additional utility into any kind of class you're playing that uses spells in any way, shape, or form. Moving up here to Elemental Adept, we have another great spell uh, capability here. Your spells ignore resistance to a damage type of your choice. When you cast spells of that type, you cannot roll a 1. So you can't auto-fail, which is great. But you're locked into your choice. So that might seem a little damning depending on how you're playing, but maybe you're playing a Tempest Cleric where Adept, Elemental Adept, Lightning, or Thunder, it's just a shoe in because you're already casting those, you're already buffing them with your Channel Divinity, whatever it is, you have a lot of things here. Or maybe you're doing a Light Cleric, uh, you, can, you have just tons of fire. Or maybe you're playing any number of other ways or configurations for any number of other casters, 
where you know the specific element you're going to focus on. So you ignore that resistance and you cannot roll a one on those respective spells, which is quite lovely for you. Now, the other group of feats are the magic initiate feats. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, these are really nice because you don't need to be a spellcaster to take them. I could say maybe, you know what? I'm playing as a paladin and I already get my own list of spells, but I want to pull from the bard ones or the warlock ones um, or just pretty much anyone who's going to use charisma or sorcerer here. I can do that. Magic initiate, you learn two cantrips and a level one spell from the X spell list and it says sorcerer in this example because we have sorcerer selected. You can cast level one spell once per long rest and your spell casting ability for all three spells is charisma. So you would key off of whatever you do. Maybe you're a wizard. Uh, maybe you're not a wizard and you have a high intelligence score. So take magic initiate wizard. Or maybe you're a cleric and you don't want to multi-class into druid. Well, you can still take druid spells using magic initiate druid. It's a really cool way to spice into classes, get a lot of cantrips, which we've said, again, are level zero spells. So you can have a lot of fun pulling from these and using these and getting all the utility out of them. Um, and you get also access to a level one spell that you only use with one long rest here. So it's a really nice way to get access to stuff without having to multi-class. Our last thing to talk about is... Warcaster. So you gain advantage on saving throws to maintain concentration on a spell. This is great if you're playing maybe a cleric who has bless up, or maybe you're playing a ranger or a druid who has fog cloud up. Any number of classes that need to maintain concentration on their uh, spells, you get an advantage on the saving throws. So don't think of this as, you know what, I'm a wizard, why am I going to use this? Because it has so many more applications outside of simply the other thing in this. You also can use a reaction to cast Shocking Grasp at a target moving out of melee range. So basically, you get a spell opportunity attack. Whereas if I'm a wizard, I don't really care about my opportunity attack. It's not that cru crucial here. But now, I actually just get, be, get to be able to use Shocking Grasp. And it's a cantrip. So it's not going to take a spell slot from me. And I can just go ahead and use this and get a little bit of damage out. So Warcaster is a really good one to give you that advantage on your saving throws or concentration and give you a little bit of um, uh, electric damage or lightning damage in this case to, to dish out. And you can stack this, right? You know what? Hey, I, I already took my elemental adept and I went into lightning and I'm already a cleric of tempest that's got tons of lightning and someone hit me and I'm doing lightning all over the place. Really think of how you can stack these feats together to really help you out in a big, big way. So at that, it brings our video here to a close and hopefully this gives you a better idea of some feats that are really gonna work alongside the play style you have selected for your class. And remember, this isn't just simply you, this is your companions too. Hey, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm playing with Asterion and I wanna get defensive duelist for Asterion because he's just already in that role. Or you know what, I, I'm playing with Karlak and she needs a lot more punching power. I'm gonna pick up Savage Attacker or Great Weapon Master or you know, I'm gonna use uh, Lavelle or Lavelle, the, the, the Githyanki and I'm gonna do Sentinel and Polar Master with her. I'm gonna turn her into a just a, a zone of control master. So. You can really use these in a lot of different ways across a lot of different characters, yourself included. And if you have any other big recommendations for feats that other people should be taking a look at, either for a specific reason or whatever it is, by all means, please let it be known in the comment section below. I am always huge on getting as much information disseminated out to people as possible. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.